crazy folks here. <laughs> Get it together. Come on. <laughs> Quit talking. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, uh, either here or online. Good morning, Jim. Um, and uh, we welcome you to First Christian Church. Just want to remind you of a couple things. Next weekend will be a, a good busy weekend. Um, for those of you who are working with Bed Bath and Behold, uh, we have uh, we are open next Saturday from 930 to noon That means of course if you know of anyone who has a need, please let them know uh, they will be able to um, Get bedding items bathroom items kitchen items. Those are the things that we give away as a part of bed bath and behold uh, also we take in items that day and just a reminder no muss, no rust no crust no dust uh, make sure those items are either um, barely used or new items uh, for our, closet, our pantry. And that'll be open, like I said, from 9.30 to noon. Um, Lloyd back here is our director. And if you have any questions or if you'd like to get involved in that, you can always talk with him. There's other people here who are, who are volunteers. And if you want to get the lowdown on what's going on, you can talk to them as well. So that's Saturday. Then Sunday, all ages are welcome. We're doing a gathering all together of the age-based ministries. We'll be meeting out at the Glen Arbor Township Park on Sunday at one o'clock uh, for hike and fun and fellowship and a variety of different things. And so we invite you to come out for that as well. We are praying and hoping for a good day. Uh, we've had some beautiful days so far this summer. So we're hoping for a good day where we can have a good outdoor time. Okay, Sandy and, and Ed are leading that particular event, and if you could let uh, Sandy know if you are going to be there so we can plan for food. Uh, that's an important component, so we make sure we have enough food for everybody. Uh, at this time, why don't you stand up, find someone you haven't said hi to yet, and say good morning to them.
right, good morning. Good morning, church. Are we ready to worship together? We learned this song last week. I didn't tell you it was new, so you actually sang it. That's <laughs> a couple trick. of laughs. All right, let's worship together.
go ahead and have a seat. Let's pray together. Lord, we have this opportunity to rejoice on this day as we say Happy Father's Day to the different fathers and we get that chance just to remind ourselves as dads of um, the real blessing it is, the tremendous blessing it is to be able to parent and to be able to um, see your kids grow up, um, see them fall in love with you, times we see them stumble and yet Lord we pray that um, you would continue to guide our kids and regardless of what age they are uh, a father will always be a father a mother will always be a mother and we care deeply we love our kids and we see the culture around us um, becoming more fragmented moving farther away from you and we just ask for your supernatural protection on our families and on our children and our grandchildren and on and on in the succeeding generations. Lord, we know um, that you do bring beauty out of ashes and you do turn graves into gardens. Lord, help that to be a reality in our lives. Uh, for those of us who have seen um, terrible times, Lord, I pray that uh, we would be a testimony that the garden of our life that has been um, reborn through you and through your strength and through your power would be a testimony to other broken people. Lord, if there's broken people within the sound of my voice, we know that by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's nothing that we can drum up in our own strength. But Holy Spirit, you can go to people who are broken and wounded and um, struggling and wondering if you really are with them in the valley. And you can show yourself strong. And so we ask that you do that. And Lord, work through us in being able to minister to people when they are hurting. Give us that spirit, that sensitive, um, compassionate spirit that is the spirit of Christ to be able to minister to them, to wrap our arms around them, to um, find a way that we can encourage them and we can show them that you are very much present and at work in their situation. Lord, I pray also that in the midst of our worship, we would remind ourselves that there's nothing better than you, as that song says. And Lord, you have created some pretty good stuff in this world. And we can make a list, a long, long list of all the beauty. And we have um, here in Traverse City the opportunity to be able to see that natural beauty. Um, we have the friendships and family. Um, Lord, we have chocolate. Um, I mean, and I, Lord, I don't mean to be, um, but it's just there's some things that are just wonderful that you've created. And over and over again. You remind us in little ways and in big ways that you've blessed us in so many ways. And so, Lord, help us to remember in all of these things that we enjoy that there's nothing better than you. Wow. God, you are... Um, there is so much beauty in this world that we miss. And that is... Um, scientists and people in the medical community uncover more and more they see at deeper and deeper levels uh, the creative power that you have and Lord we ask for your forgiveness that oftentimes all those things happen and we don't realize that that's who you are that you created all those things because of your power because you are a beautiful God because you are a God who wanted to bless your creation and so you blessed us with all these beautiful things. And yet oftentimes we won't walk right by them and don't even notice. Lord, help us to see your beauty and help us to, to know that it's only a glimpse of um, the fullness of all you are as a beautiful God. And we pray this prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Here at First Christian Church, um, this is an open table for all who recognize Jesus as the Son of God and accept him as their personal Lord and Savior. Um, if anyone needs the elements, we have them available. <laughs> okay. Okay. Today I have two stories, two different endings and one significant learning curve. It was COVID, it was winter in Florida, and I wasn't attending church because of the pandemic. Florida has so many people who have so very little that it seemed like a good idea to be ready with some cash to address the needs that God put in front of me. I can say it felt like a work of God because uh, a work of God taking shape, because I realized that it didn't happen every day or even in regular places, and I had felt this pull to be ready. So story number one, it was 90 degrees, humid day. She was sitting in the sun on a curb in a parking lot with a sign that read homeless. She looked beaten down and miserable. I pulled over and I ran back to her. I held out the money and before I could speak, tears came to her eyes and she's the one who said, God bless you. Moving along to a different day, I'm in heavy traffic on another really hot day. There's lots of those there and I'm not ready. I, my purse was in the back seat. Suddenly there was a lady alongside the car holding, holding a sign and wearing a haunted look in her eyes. She seemed utterly hopeless, and I couldn't get it together fast enough to help her before the traffic overtook us and I had to drive away. I didn't circle around, I didn't try to get back to her, and I can still see her face today. I think I will for a long time. In her shortcomings and our failures, we can find humility, a way to approach God. It's in that humble state when we recognize that we have messed up and pride is absent and awe is easy, that we are available to hear God's direction. Maybe next time it will be in time to make a difference. Maybe next time I will be his hands and feet. Thankfully, our Lord Jesus, who humbled himself even to death, was and is always there, always ready and motivated by unfathomable love. For on the very night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Will you join me now in the, with the wafer? Likewise, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Will you join me in prayer before we take the cup together? Father, remind us that in the small moments of life, in the seemingly inconsequential choices we make, we may be missing opportunities to do your will and your work. And thank you, Father, that when we do fall down, you are there, available to forgive us and to walk with us into better choices. 
Thank you for your son's precious body and blood and for his name, the name of Jesus, in which we pray. Let's take the cup together now. Amen. Would you please stand as we continue to worship?
We invite you to be seated. Thank you for your worship. So we've been in this series um, entitled Forces Pulling. And um, I had shared last week that we were going to be in a certain portion of Acts chapter 2. We're talking about what happened after the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. The, just the radical shift of a force of the Holy Spirit pulling the, those early believers in Christ um, toward him and what happened as a result of that. And we talked last week about the unifying forces that take place within the body of Christ that are mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and those are fellowship, worship, and provision. Uh, and there's others, but those were those that were just radically different for the culture, for the time period, um, and, and those that we need to really focus and take a look at today as well. That idea of being in fellowship, worshiping together, and the idea of providing one for another. Um, this week, I want to talk a little bit about a kingdom equation. And of course, when I say equation, um, you, generally you lose about half the audience. Because there's some people who just don't like math. You know, and they're like, not an equation. And I finally figured this out, why some people don't like math. It starts very early in our lives, in kindergarten, first grade, and, and um, there are some who just fall in love with math, and I'm convinced that probably they had teachers that talked, when they talked about two plus two equals four, they said, you know, this is the equation I want you to solve. Because those who probably don't like math, they, they weren't called equations. The teacher made a mistake. Because what is the other word that we use when we talk about math equations? We call them math problems. Well, nobody likes a problem. I mean, now think about it. If you're four, five, six years old and you're just learning math, you know, what do you think when your parents at home say, we have a problem? Or how about this one? What are we going to do about all these problems? Or how about this one? You are a problem child. <laughs> Hopefully, not many of us heard that one. But we're going to talk about a kingdom equation in this idea of uh, forces pulling. Um, so all that being said, I have a problem for you. Or, well, we have an equation. Uh, and this is the equation, this kingdom equation. Let me give it to you because it's outlined in Scripture in these verses and we understand that there's these unifying forces that are pulling believers together. And it made a radical difference. And if you go back to last week's ser ser sermon, you'll see this idea of these forces that the Holy Spirit brought upon the early church and were gladly received by the early church. This idea that they, they longed to be not only with God in worship, but they longed to be with each other, and they longed to provide for each other. However, one of the things you have to recognize is this scripture tells us that it wasn't just about the early Christians. It wasn't just an inward focus. That's important, and that obviously made a huge difference in how those on the outside saw them taking care of each other, worshiping in joy, fellowshipping, and just having, I mean, there was something about the nature of their gatherings and their time together that made a radical difference in the life of the people who were on the outside looking in. And this verse portrays this in an equation. So the equation is everyone plus anyone plus all equals addition. Anybody would like to describe what I mean by that? Okay, I'll do it for you. <laughs> Acts chapter 2 Again, let's read these verses, Acts 2, 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so as we take a look at this equation, we see a few words in here that I want to pull out and talk about the spirit of what was happening here. Because the, the Holy Spirit, when he came at Pentecost, as I said last week, impacted those early believers to treat and care for one another in certain ways and to also worship God together in joy and everything that is mentioned in those scriptures and others as well. But there is an outward force as well that the Holy Spirit is having occur here because something that is transformational that happens within these early Christians begins to leak its way out. And people start to notice. Now, I wanna tell you that um, in most cultures over the centuries, um, the idea of I gotta get mine is really how most cultures work. Uh, In other words, people have to be, in order to survive, very self-focused on I've got to do what I've got to do to survive, even if, if it means this other person doesn't have enough, or I have to take from this other person, or I have to ignore these needs. And I don't believe that um, first century Judea was any different. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons why Jesus' presence and his teaching and what he modeled was so transformational, because it, Jesus' teaching and what he modeled was so radically different from the rest of the world. And I do believe that as we get, as a a country, as a culture, as we get farther away from um, God's direction, that we will see people just being more and more about themselves. That's what happens in cultures that lose sight of God. The opposite is also true. When you see a group of people or you see Um, a nation or you see a culture draw close to God and be led by the Holy Spirit, then you will also see as a natural outgrowth of that ministry beyond the church walls or beyond just the body of Christ. And this is a a tremendous example of this here. And so you have um, the first part of this equation is everyone. So the scripture says that everyone is in awe because there were supernatural forces pulling. There were supernatural forces at work, and it said that everybody around held the disciples, the apostles, in awe because of what? There were miraculous things that were happening. So if you remember, when Jesus was on earth, he had sent out first the 12, and then 70, and he actually told them, he said, in my name, you're going to drive out demons, you're going to heal the sick, and actually that's what happened. So what's going on is Jesus begins to impress upon his early followers that as you commit to Jesus Christ, as you commit to a leading of the Holy Spirit, supernatural things can occur. Now, Let's transcribe that now to 2,000 years later and ask ourselves, what does that mean for us? Because the outward forces, there were people on the outside who were being impacted because there were supernatural things occurring. And we gotta ask ourselves, well, wait a second, if that was occurring back then, there's all different opinions on if it's occurring now If it doesn't occur any longer, if it doesn't occur any longer, why doesn't it occur any longer? And so let me say this about these supernatural things that are occurring, and and sometimes I wish I had a pulpit, even though we don't use a pulpit anymore, so I could step out of the pulpit and say, now I'm going to give you one man's opinion. In prayer, all the beauty of God, chocolate comes into my mind. Why does chocolate come into my mind? I gotta pick myself out of the pulpit and say, because I like chocolate. And for some reason that came into my mind. So now I step out 
And I say, why, do, you know, why is it possible that these things don't occur any longer, that there's not supernatural things happening in the life of the church today? Um, if you remember, <clears throat> there's a point in Jesus' ministry where he comes up and the disciples are trying to um, cleanse a demon-possessed boy. Um, just a sidelight, um, there, there's some things I've read in the news lately that really make me wonder that there's not some strong demon oppression or possession that's taking place in people's lives. Some weird things that people are doing. Um, so, you know, can it still happen today? I believe those problems can still exist today. The farther we get again away from God as a culture, the more we'll see those things. So the disciples are trying to um, bring a demon out of a, a person, and they can't do it. And Jesus comes along, and he does it. And then the disciples come to him and say, well, you know, we've been doing all these miraculous things. Why couldn't we do this? Remember what he says about it, about why it doesn't happen? He says, because you don't have enough faith. So something more, in my opinion, happened at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. And, and I want to be careful with how I say this, because Jesus is present with the disciples, and they are able to do these miracles because they see Jesus doing them. They believe that Jesus can do them because they actually see them. And then Jesus says, you will be able to do these things, and I believe that they went out, and at times they had faith to have these supernatural things occur. Other times, they didn't have faith. They begin to, you know, kind of think to themselves, maybe we can't do this. And as soon as they can't do this, they can't do it. After Pentecost, I believe there is a period of um, massive faith pressure being released, if I can put it this way. In other words, the Holy Spirit comes. These were people who ran away, just a reminder, ran away, did not have faith enough in Jesus to stick by him when he was arrested, condemned, hung on a cross. They did not have that faith. After Jesus comes back, they see him alive. I want to tell you, seeing a guy who just died on a cross, who you buried personally in a tomb, come out and is alive, that'll increase your faith a little bit. So their faith suddenly is at a different level, and now the Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit, one of the things the Holy Spirit brings is power. And so they are at a very high faith level, and they have just had the Holy Spirit come upon them in power. And I believe that part of the reason you saw a large number of miraculous things happen is because there was a faith pressure in their life, if I could put it that way, with it was just released because of all that had happened. They'd seen Jesus resurrect from the grave. They had the Holy Spirit come upon them. And so what I would say is here is then extrapolate out, come forward 2,000 years, and let's ask ourselves why we don't see those kind of things. I just don't think we had the faith. Now, I don't think if we had the faith, we'd, we'd be you know, up on a stage in a, a white um, uh, outfit, you know, um, jumping around and slapping people on the forehead and all those kind of things. Um, but I do believe that we would see a lot more miraculous things occurring. Um, I have some friends downstate that um, started attending the church that I was pastoring down there, and they came private, privately to me at one point in time. I loved their spirit. They came privately to me, and they said, we believe that the, one of the gifts the Holy Spirit has given to us, it was a couple, um, is the gift of healing. And they said, you guys do a weekly, you know, at, at that point in time, our church had an open altar during prayer time, and people would come forward and sometimes had physical needs, spiritual needs, whatever. And they just asked their pastor privately for permission, would it be okay for us to come and lay hands on people and pray for their healing? And they, nobody in the congregation knew that they had the spiritual gift of healing, except their pastor. 
And the specific reason they did that was because of the abuse that can take place with different spiritual gifts. And so because of the current climate, they felt the best way to do this was just to do it quietly and privately that God knew what was happening. Nobody else needed to know. And I said, by all means. And we did see people healed in that church. Now, at the same time, it's not something that we felt like we had to broadcast and all that sort of thing that I think in some cases we feel the need to because the issue is this. The, um, every spiritual gift is just as important as the next spiritual gift. And so the idea that everyone is, was in awe over su supernatural forces pulling um, I don't believe that ended. I do believe there was a tremendous release of that at Pentecost, but I don't believe that ended. Um, I just don't think we have the faith. Because in most cases, when we're sick, uh, we are more likely to visit the doctor than to pray. And I'm not against doctors, but we're more likely to do a lot of things besides put it in God's hands. And that shows a lack of faith. And I don't believe the Holy Spirit works in a setting where there's a lack of faith. I'm not going to point to an individual. I think we're all in the same boat on this one. I just think that as a, as a, the church in America, if I could put it that way, I just think we lack faith in a lot of ways. And that our, our, our um, idea of how God moves and how God works, that God actually wants to heal. Uh, you know, my prayer was about the beauty of the, all the things that God has created. I mean, he continues, even though sometimes we're just a wreck, he continues to bring spring every year. He continues to bring chocolate. He, he brings good gifts if, if we are willing to see them. And um, I believe he wants to bring the gift of healing. But we do have to have faith to believe that he will do it. We also have to be realistic about that because as a good friend of mine taught me years ago who was, um, he had um, stage four cancer and did not look good. And I visited him and he said, Pastor Matt, God's gonna heal me. He said, one way or another, I'm going to get healed. And he was. Um, it is appointed unto all of us once to die. And at some point, you can have all the faith in the world, we're still going to die. But even in death, God heals. He can heal through the doctor's hands, he can heal supernaturally, or he heals through taking us into glory. But what is our faith like? There's a supernatural force pulling in the early church. Everyone held the believers in awe because they saw supernatural things happening in front of them that they could not define in any other way but that God was moving and the Holy Spirit was doing something. So everyone plus anyone. There were um, not only supernatural forces pulling, there were, there were forces of generosity and I won't spend too much time on this because we talked about sacrificial, sacrificial giving last week as far as they gave to each other and any time there was a need, they gave. But it, it says in the scripture that they gave to anyone who had a need. And so this wasn't just, okay, here are the believers together over here and one of their widows has a need or something like that. They, their generosity spanned beyond just the body of believers, just those who believed in Christ. It didn't matter who it was. And so there was a generous force pulling of giving to anyone that had a need and that they were willing to give of themselves and give sacrificially. And like I said, I won't spend much time on that because I talked about it last week, but I do believe it's important for us to know that the early disciples did not distinguish between those who were believers in Christ and those who weren't. There was a spirit of generosity that overflowed into everybody's life. 
So we have this idea of everyone plus anyone plus all. The scripture tells us that I read earlier says all the believers were held in favor. There was a relational force pulling. Um, there was the people on the outside, and you, you got to understand something. I mean, take a look at the whole picture here of what's happening in the historical context. These believers, that supernatural things are happening, generosity is just exploding, they're willing to give and willing to be compassionate and seeing people healed and seeing people cared for. This is just days after their leader was crucified. And there's this revolutionary change that happens as a result of their leader being killed. Now, what they also communicated very quickly was he didn't just die, he rose again, and he is the Messiah. I mean, that obviously was what they were teaching. But all these people have heard what's going on. And if they hadn't heard up till then, maybe because they lived you know, out in the boondocks, um, I think probably in that day and age there were boondocks. They, you know, and, and they finally came into Jerusalem and they heard about all that's happened and they see these early Christians and um, there are these now relational forces pulling where primarily the, the Jewish people in Judea, in the half-breed Jewish people in Samaria, the people of the surrounding area, they're coming in and they have heard about this Jesus person. Maybe they even sat on a, a hillside and they were one of the thousands that were fed miraculously by Jesus. Or maybe they were one of the ones who was standing along the Via Della Rosa shouting, crucify him. But it, it didn't matter at that point who that person was. They're looking on and they're saying, there is something radically different about how these people act and interact with each other. Again, I would say in a culture that gets far and farther and farther away from God, those who are true believers in Christ, led by the power of the Holy Spirit, they will stand out. Now, we're going to find out next week that they stood out so much that in some cases they were persecuted and martyred for their faith. But it says early on, before that persecution starts, that everyone held those early believers in favor because of what was happening. Because the generosity of spirit. Because of the care and compassion. Because of the supernatural things that were occurring. It says all, everyone held them in favor. And I'm actually convinced that you'll get to heaven and you know, I don't know that you'll actually know this about them once you get to heaven. I don't think you'll need to. But I believe that there's probably some people, Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, people who stood on the Via Della Rosa and shouted crucify him, that after a while, they're just like, man, this guy must have been the real deal. And how, how did they know that? They knew that by the early believers. They were just like, okay, I, I was not on board with this. I had heard from other people that this Jesus, you know, he was just one more in a long line of charlatans trying to fool the people. And I jumped on board with that boat, and I was there, and I was one of the ones who shouted, crucify him. And then they're like, how the heck does this kind of transformational work and attitude and belief change everything about these people's lives? Everything about these people's lives. Because Peter goes from this fearful fisherman who just ran away because his leader, who he sold out his life to, 
he suddenly thought to himself, I am more about saving my own skin than following him to the cross. And then he stands up and with power preaches at Pentecost. And then he walks by someone who's infirm. His shadow moves across that person who's infirm and they're healed. That'd get my attention. I don't care, you know, how's that phrase go in humor? I don't care who you are. That gets your attention. And, and there were people who probably were totally against Christ and totally against everything that they were seeing and their, their spiritual eyes were darkened for whatever reason. And then at some point, some of them, I think, just said, holy moly. I've seen that happen. Um, I went to a Nazarene church when I was in high school. Good people. Um, yeah, I could tell you some really stories about beautiful, beautiful people. Loved on me. Um, about an hour down the road, there was another Nazarene church. And um, I met the pastor, and he was, uh, he's not the usual pastor. He's kind of rough around the edges. Um, definitely had the spiritual gift of evangelism. I mean, you could be a Christian for 20 years, and he was still trying to save you. That's how powerful his gift of evangelism was. Um, but I heard his story. He actually wrote a short book that I read. I read his testimony. And he pastored this Nazarene church in New York State. And um, he had been, uh, the old term that we would use, he had been a ruffian. Uh, he'd been a problem, you know, when someone said, you know, that, there's a problem child. He, he, that, he was the guy. And grew up in a rough environment, became a teenager, got involved in a lot of, you know, really bad stuff, self-destructive, really his life's falling apart, alcohol, drugs. And due to his addictions, started, started stealing to support the addictions. And he's in his early 20s, and um, he breaks into this church because the addiction's so fierce. He's like, I got to get something. He breaks into a church and he steals a bunch of stuff out of the church. A uh, couple years pass. God gets a hold of him. Supernatural transformation in this guy's life. And his testimony is beautiful because of this. The church that he stole from is where he was pastoring at the time that I met him is God had called him into the ministry. He had gone and he prepared. I don't think he ever prepared. He thought he was going to be going back to the same church that he lifted some stuff out of. That's exactly where God called him. What happened back then can still happen today. And, and, and sometimes it even starts with a couple ruffians. And so, you know, it's a little bit of a scary prayer sometimes, but look, sometimes we as a church just need to pray, Lord, send us the worst of the worst so we can show, and I just scared a few of you, I know. <laughs> send us the worst of the worst so that when they are transformed, no, everybody who looks on just says, only God could do that. Only God could do that. That's how far... His grace reaches. And um, I pray that um, uh, we as a church, as we pray, as we labor, as we teach, as we preach, as we minister, that that spirit that is so prevalent in the New Testament, and I see last week with the different things I shared about the inward work, I would tell you that... Um, I'm so impressed with the fellowship of this body and the unity that is emerging. 
and that there is a New Testament church here that just really wants to bust out. And there's certain things I do believe that have to happen to us, to transform us. And if God, if we allow God, if we allow the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us, then I believe that the Holy Spirit will not pass by when he's looking for a people who will minister to them out there. Because God is for them out there. Not against them. That's why he came and died on a cross. To save a wretch like me. And he still wants to do it. And as the church becomes the church under the direction and leadership and power of the Holy Spirit, God will send us those who have spiritual needs. And the Holy Spirit will do the work through us. Will we let it happen? Because the final equation, how the equation finishes it up, it says everyone plus anyone plus all equals addition. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I don't believe that there was a supernatural response of people coming in um, just because the people were nice or because they provided help or something like that. It was the Holy Spirit doing a work in us to change us from the inside out. And then once God got us to a certain place, got them to a certain place, he says, now I can send them other people. And when those other people see what's going on, they're going to be attracted. They are going to be attracted. And they were. And there was addition. There were people, even when persecution occurred in the early church, it was still growing. Because there was something very real at work. And, and that very real that was at work was the power of the Holy Spirit working in the, church, the early church. <clears throat> I don't believe he's done. He still wants to do it. Let's pray together. Lord, this is um, convicting for all of us because we really do see something transformational in the early church. And, and you still want to do that. You still want to do it in people's lives. I, I can't imagine that there's a young person out there who would break into a church and steal from it, and then you would so transform their life that they would become eventually pastor of that church, and not to say, Lord, you, you um, rejoice in making that happen. And so, Lord, I pray that you would do it again. Do it through us. Help us to be your people so that there would be people who would come to you as a result of the fellowship and the worship, the unity, the w willingness to minister to the people around us, to have compassion on them and to care for their needs. Lord, make us into that kind of people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. <clears throat>
Lord, turn us into the kind of people that were so enamored with your spirit that was present on earth um, through the power and presence of Jesus Christ and the spirit that was very much present in their lives as the Holy Spirit came and just transformed what was happening. Lord, do that work again, we pray, in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you as you go this day.